I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Price and Dr. DeVries for this uh, kind invitation. Uh, usually when I'm out at meetings giving talks, it's talking about outcomes after liver or pancreatic resection. But I find these talks a lot more near and dear to my heart. So thanks, Ray, and thanks, Dr. DeVries, for this opportunity. Uh, I can spend this time giving you a quick minute about my background, so that will make you understand why I'm standing here today, and also give you the basis of my talk. So I was born and uh, bred in India uh, to a very remote rural, surgeon general, uh, rural general surgeon father and a housewife mother. Uh, we were surrounded by poverty. I did my med school in India, then I moved on to what is now European Union, I spent several years there and I got my FRCS and then I moved to the US. I've been here for about uh, 16 years now. So in a way, I've seen nearly the entire spectrum of healthcare settings going from India, where in those days sometimes, the only treatment we could offer was compassion to Europe and to the US, where on occasions I find that we're so enamored with our technology, we completely forget about compassion. My more recent uh, background is I'm a surgical oncologist by trade, and uh, I also have a business background. And what kind of uh, drives me to do what I'm doing, the basis of this talk is, I have a passion for global health. And I also did two years of a dedicated research fellowship in minimal invasive surgery. So one of my goals, in, uh, of the several goals in global health has been, to make sure that we can make laparoscopic surgery available to every human in the world, regardless of their location and socioeconomic status. So a uh, few people have asked me, what's the basis uh, of the title of my talk? And it essentially is combining the field of business with the field of healthcare. That's in a jiffy, but in a little bit of a detail, it's taking two concepts in business uh, and applying them to the field of surgery so that we can develop innovative surgical tools that will improve surgical care to different parts of the world. So the first concept I want to talk about is something that was uh, uh, put forth by Schumpeter. Uh, Joseph Alva Schumpeter was born in Erstweil, Austria, which is now in the Czech Republic. He was a professor of economics, then for a brief stint, he served as the Austrian Minister of Finance. And after that, he moved to Harvard in the US, and he spent the rest of his life there, and he wrote one of the most famous books titled Capitalism, Socialism, and Democracy. He is one of the most revered economists of the 20th century. In fact, he's so revered that most of you in this room probably read The Economist magazine. There's a column dedicated on the name of Schumpeter. In fact, this week it's all about how to improve healthcare and education in India. So, Schumpeter's Gale, as we all know, is nothing but another name for creative destruction, which he defined it as a process of industrial mutation that incessantly revolutionizes the economic structure from within, incessantly destroying the old one, and incessantly creating a new one. He put this forth almost 80 years ago in his book, and to this day, many people think that creative destruction in some form or the other is the driving force behind entrepreneurship and capitalism, and it accounts for more than 50% of the productivity growth. So let's look at some examples of creative destruction in healthcare. <clears throat> so for centuries, it was thought that all diseases that a human could have were related to bad blood. And it was also thought that if you drain that blood, they'll get better. So what sick people used to do is they used to go to barbers because they were the only people that would do this. The intelligent people went into medicine. It's the barbers that did surgery in those days. And that's why they were called barber surgeons. So that's how the spiral comes about. So what they do is they go to this barber surgeon, he put his forearm in a spiral like this, and the red and white indicates that the bad arterial and venous blood is draining away from the patient, and white indicates health is getting back to the patient. And that kind of concept stayed on for centuries till as recently as 200 years ago when our first president got ill, he had multiple treatments of bloodletting. Unfortunately, that was in vain. He died from that illness. 
So what happened there is there was a destruction of this established and old but fallacious way of thinking that all diseases was caused by bad blood. And that wrong thought was creatively replaced by a new thought called the germ theory. And this is one of the classic examples of creative destruction. And we know now, after knowing about the germs, we have discovered antibiotics, and that has extended the lifespan and continues to do so. Another example is peptic ulcer disease. Till about 20 to 30 years ago, we thought that ulcer disease was always due to increased acid, and all our treatment options were directed towards reducing acid production. Again, this required a destruction of this established and old, but wrong form of thinking to create a new theory that peptic ulcer disease was actually caused by a bug, and the name of that bug is H. pylori. This is another example where creative destruction of an established thought has changed the way of how we treat diseases. And in the modern day, Dr. Price might know, and I know because we did some elective peptic ulcer surgery, but if you talk the current surgical residents in training, my trainees that are gonna come out in three months, the number of elective peptic ulcer surgery cases they've done are zero. So that's how we've changed uh, the quality of human life by incessantly doing episodes of creative destruction. Having said that, I don't think we apply that principle well enough to the field of medicine or surgery. The next business concept that I want to talk about is something that was put forward by Christensen. I think many in this audience know who Clayton Christensen is. He's a professor at Harvard Business School. And in 2011, he was voted as the number one most influential business thinker in the world. He put forward this concept of disruptive innovation and that is an innovation that creates a new market by applying a different set of values which ultimately un unexpectedly overtakes an existing market. Some of the themes of disruptive innovation are they usually tend to be technologically more straightforward. They can be built by off-the-shelf components. They're often simpler. They may offer less than the established product. And they may also have a different package of attributes. So let's look at some examples of uh, disruptive innovation. If you look at this telephone, <laughs> this was the telephone that we used from the day that Alexander Graham Bell, obviously a few decades afterwards, it was the old landline, the analog phone. And then about 20, I think 20 to 30 years ago, the mobile phones came about. And I remember my first mobile phone, it was about this big, but I was still so proud to have it. And I was living in Europe at that time. When you get a phone call, you pull out this massive aerial. The signal wasn't that clear and all that. But still, the reception wasn't good. They were clunkier. They weren't as user-friendly, but they offered an entirely new attribute. They were portable, unlike your landline. So move on a few decades. Improvisations happen, and this is where we are. The mobile phones now have essentially replaced landlines, and if you go to a country like mine in India, I think the ratio of mobile phones to landlines is grossly disproportionate. The next example is television. Still about 20 years ago, it was all cathode ray tubes. And at that time, this technology existed, LCD technology, but there were problems with that. The clarity wasn't good. There were problems with battery consumption and so on. So they used the LCD technology where clarity wasn't a priority, like one of this. I remember playing this game so many times. But eventually, technology improved to the point now that every TV is either an LED or a plasma screen. We don't see cathedral tubes anymore. So in the field of business, I think disruptive innovation, there are many more examples that Christensen has written in his book that is constantly being applied. I don't think we do it that well in the field of medicine or surgery. At least in surgery in the recent times, every new innovation is not disruptive. It's more expensive, it's more complicated, it's more sophisticated. And I think that's where we need a fundamental shift in our change of mind. Now let's come to where surgery is. There's nothing in surgery that's complete without talking about William Stewart Halstead. He's considered by many, or maybe all, to be the father of modern American, or maybe surgery in the world. 
and there's practically nothing in surgery to which his name is not associated with. And one of them is a bowel anastomosis. Although originally described by Connell in 1820, 1882, Halstead described this in 1887. And he described the one layer anastomosis, and obviously in those days they used sutures. Now, fast forward nearly 130 years, we do the bowel anastomosis the same way. The only difference is we've replaced sutures with staples. Really not much has changed. If someone has something in the colon or the small bowel, we're using the same principles. Take that piece out, put the remaining two pieces back together. So not much has changed, and I think that's where we need a lot of force of creative destruction to see how things can be done differently. On the bright side, in the last 20, 30 years, we've seen laparoscopic surgery. That was a good example of creative destruction. That has revolutionized the way we perform surgical procedures. But instead of following that up with disruptive innovation, they're good, but this is what we're doing. We're following up laparoscopic surgery with notes. In this current issue of uh, Archives of Surgery, I read the first report of notes-based total mesorectal excision. This is more expensive, more complicated, and more difficult, and less affordable to many people in different parts of the world. Or we follow that up by robotic surgery. The current Da Vinci to buy is about $2 million. And I'm in the US, and I think my university is doing well because Nebraska is in, I think, top five in terms of the least fiscal deficit and so on. We've been thinking for two years whether we can afford another robot. So laparoscopic surgery was good, but where it's going is it's becoming more complex, more expensive, and more sophisticated. Instead, I think we should hit that laparoscopic surgery field with a wave of disruptive innovation. It's only when we do that, I think we can make laparoscopic surgery available to every human being in the world. And why is that important? It is because this audience probably knows this phrase by heart, global burden of surgical disease. Some think it's 11%, some think it's even higher. It could be 16% or even 20%. So about 11 to 20% of diseases in the world require the services of a surgeon and its surgical tools. And at the same time, there's a significant disparity. This was a paper published in Lancet. You can see of the 234 million surgeries done worldwide, less than 5% are done in the poorest regions of the world, and nearly 75% are done in the rich part of the world. Not only is there a disparity in the type of surge, in the number of surgery, but there's also a disparity in the type of surgery that's done. And what I mean by that is the days of saying that, you know, well-intentioned students or medical students going to a poor part of the world and saying, under the light of a lantern, I opened a surgical atlas for the first time and took out someone's appendix. I don't think we should be saying these days that any care is better than no care. That should be out of the window. No matter where they are, if they require surgery, they have to be provided care that is appropriate and what we think is the best possible care. So I go to India two to three times a year and I meet my classmates in medical school, some of whom are surgeons. They still take out the gallbladder by the open approach. And they're living in cities as big with a population of 10 million or so. Now when I tell them, you know, laparoscopic approach is the gold standard, they say, but we can't do it. The reason they can't do it is if you want to do laparoscopic surgery, this is what we need. This is a suite here, and it on an average costs anywhere from 400 to 700,000, depending on how many gizmos you want. But it's hard to build these suites in a country like India, or many countries across the world, where basic surgical services are so scarce, and even when they're available, people can't get to them. So this is the crossroads of what I say, applying the principles of business to healthcare. And let's take the example of that phones again. Creative destruction, disruptive innovation, landline phones, which when I was growing up, being an educated family, took us eight years to get a landline. Now I go to India, practically everyone, even in the remote rural villages, has a mobile phone. 
When we do that same application to the field of surgery, that's when we'll be able to provide surgical care to everyone in the world. And this is what I call is the glorious crossroads of creative destruction, destruction, disruptive innovation and surgery. And this is what we've been doing at my university for the last few years. And the initial result of our work is a tool that we have developed, which is in its early phase. And the name of that tool, we call that Chota Scope. So what we want to do with this Chota Scope is we want to use this tool to make laparoscopic surgery available in every corner of the world. It doesn't have to be in a hospital. It could be a remote setting and so on. So how are we going to do that? So if you look at it, this is what we need to have now to perform laparoscopic surgery. So when Dr. Rodas goes about in Ecuador in his mobile clinics, he needs to take these towers or some part of it. Or when Dr. Price goes to Mongolia, he needs some part of this or maybe the entire tower to perform his laparoscopic surgery. So what we have done is we've taken all of this, combined them into one small portable piece that can be carried just like you carry an ophthalmoscope or something like that. So for a lack of better image, I just put this to give you a, an idea of what it will be like. It is something that's going to be in a packaged in a box where if Dr. Price is going to Mongolia, I could give him about four or five of those. He goes there and just takes it out of a box and it's ready to use to perform laparoscopic surgery. So we have the initial version done now. We're in the process of working on the next improvised version. This is cheap affordable, simpler. It may not give you everything that a state-of-the-art laparoscopic suite does, but it will let you do laparoscopic surgery. And that is disruptive innovation. And even in the US, I don't need a 1080p screen to take out someone's appendix. A 720p will do. But we go to 1080, then we go to high def, then we go to 3D, because they're all good marketing tools. So w the future for this, I think there's a significant market potential for this, which we've done some marketing analysis using my business background, because for anything new to come out into mass scale production, you need investors. And when you're talking about investors, you have to satisfy the primary rule in business, that's to maximize stakeholders' value. The market potential comes in many markets, emerging markets, India and China, 2.5 billion people, as more and more people enter the middle class, more and more are seeking medical care. And they're also reading the web. When they come to you now, they're just not coming for any care. They want to have the laparoscopic procedure that's done. Battlefront, when they triage or developed world. I live in a state where 80% of the population lives in the city that I live in. We have small towns around where there's one community surgeon that they don't find it worthy investment to put in $700,000 to open a laparoscopic surgery suite. So we get some patients that are transferred to us for laparoscopic procedures. Battlefront, it's very easy to know that you've broken a limb. It's very hard to know when your spleen is bleeding unless it's an extremis. So at the battlefront, when you're triaging patients, you can do this portable laparoscopy in a few minutes and appropriately triage patients. In the same way, you can do laparoscopy in space. You can also do laparoscopy in unusual settings. So our mind is entrenched that laparoscopy should be done in the OR and nowhere else. But that's what we need to destroy by taking laparoscopy out of the OR into unusual settings, and that's the new concept we're going to develop. Uh, it's beneficial to the patients. It reduces disparities in surgical care. It improves social productivity and augments quality of life. So to conclude, the way I look at it is, I think every human life is a gift that needs to be cherished. When that life makes that transition from being in the womb to the hands of the mother, that's a gift. And every parent holds that child with hopes and dreams that they will scale the mountains of success. But when that life is interrupted by sickness, and if that sickness needs surgery, and if that surgical care and surgical tools are not available, that is a gift we have lost forever. So my goal is, that's what we're working on, is to continue to develop this tool so that we can make sure that every patient that needs laparoscopic surgery in every part of the world 
will be able to get that. Once again, thank you for the opportunity.